Before we get started with this podcast, the team at Working Preacher would like to welcome you to the first week of our fall fundraising campaign. All gifts made during the fall campaign will be doubled with a dollar for dollar match up to $10,000. When you make a gift during the fall campaign, October 1st through the 31st, we will send you a free ebook titled Digital Jazz, Media and Technology for Preaching. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you, and we are so grateful for each and every one of you. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Thank you. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. Joy, it is so good to have you here. Uh, For our uh, regular listeners, we want to take just a moment to introduce Professor Joy J. Moore, who is a professor of biblical preaching here at Luther Seminary, uh, a regular on our sister podcast, The Sermon Brainwave, which uh, talks about the revised common lectionary uh, on workingpreacher.org. Uh, but she's coming to join us over here at the Narrative Lectionary, uh, at least for for uh, for now and, and in the future. And we're just so delighted to have her. So welcome, Joy. Glad yeah. to have you. I'm very gl- I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, I, um, I, I admit that uh, long before I came to Luther, uh, I was actually using the Narrative Lectionary to teach preaching. So uh, it's kind of exciting to be able to be a part of the podcast now. That's so cool. Thank you. And uh, I know listeners will learn more about you um, as uh, just naturally happens as we uh, weave our own stories into God's story and how God's story then uh, reshapes our stories. So uh, we'll look forward to those things happening. This is the podcast for October 9th, 2022. It's the uh, Covenant and Commandments at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20. Just a word. So uh, in the previous week um, for October 2nd, it was the rescue at the Red Sea. Not too much happens narratively between Exodus uh, 14 and Exodus 19. About the only thing that really happens is there's a lot of complaining and a lot of lack of faith. (laughs) Uh, And immediately the people um, show their lack of uh, trust. Uh, in this God who has newly delivered them. Uh, But then God takes them and brings them to Mount Sinai. And um, first you get the the covenant. Uh, One of of our old uh, former uh, preaching professors and friend, Dave Lose, used to say, it's really important to understand that Exodus 19 becomes before 20. That is, God enters into the covenant. God chooses them. And then God gives the law. The law is not a condition for God's faithfulness to the covenant promises. Yeah, I, I, I think that really is important. I would mention just one thing that happens in between, and that's the giving of the manna. So you're, you're right, Ralph, the, uh, the people complain and God sh- continues to go God, show God's faithfulness uh, through the giving of manna and water in the wilderness. But What is that? Uh, what's that? What's that? That's a that's a Hebrew joke, Catherine. Oh, right. Because <laughs> yes, man sorry. means what is it? <laughs> what is it? I sorry. thought uh, I, I thought I froze for a minute there or something. Yes, yes. What's that, manna? What is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so nineteen comes before twenty, which is an obvious thing to say, but um, important theologically here because the the covenant comes before the commandments. Uh, when I teach these texts, uh, I just finished a class on uh, on these t- on the Pentateuch, um, and uh, I always say uh, I always highlight that particular verse, uh, uh, verses five and six in chapter nineteen. Um, Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. And, that, and then, uh, so priestly kingdom, holy nation, what does a priest do? Well, a priest mediates between God and the people. So if, if the people are to be a priestly nation, they're, uh, they're chosen not for their own sex, but to be a mediator, to be 
a, a sign, a light to the nations. And then the Ten Commandments given afterwards uh, tell them how to live as a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. So that order is important to remember. And there's this, um, just in terms of the texts that are read this week, that Moses goes up to God, but God speaks again. You know, Moses, the voice, the the uh, bush burns and Moses goes over and God speaks. Yeah. And what, what God does is recall what God has done. Um, mm -hmm. And that testimony of what God has done is actually what the people of God are invited to give witness to. So that witness is repeating the acts uh, of God. And it is not only in, um, in our vocabulary of a testimony report, but it is evident in our obedience as a response to having heard of God and what God is doing, we join with God. And that's what Moses has done. So here again, God is calling for people to bring witness to the world that the creator is a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. And a God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, right? That, no, that's, no. The, that's the foundation for it all. Yes, has not forgotten God's previous promises as we talk about the covenant. Uh, they, God, God made this, this covenant. It seems like this covenant has been forgotten in, in uh, this time of, uh, of being enslaved in Egypt. no. God has heard the people's cry and God is responding not just to the cry of the people, but out of the character of God, which is a covenant keeping God. Right. right, right. I, it's uh, I think Rolf has frozen up, so we'll just keep talking until he unfreezes. But the. Uh, um, the different communities of faith have different ways of counting the Ten Commandments. Right. So mm -hmm. um, uh, Catholics. Lutherans, Episcopalians, and Jews, uh, they actually count that verse, uh, that verse two as the first word. You notice it's not a commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It's not a commandment. It's a statement, right? Mm -hmm. To go back to our English uh, grammar days, right? It's uh, indicative and not an imperative. But uh, but Jews count that as the first word of the ten words that God speaks, mm -hmm. uh, which I I find really moving, right? Because everything else leads from that. I am the Lord your God, who who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. As you said, Joy, a covenant keeping God, uh, mm -hmm. a faithful God. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. Therefore, you should honor your father and your mother. Therefore you should not commit adultery, you know, uh, uh, therefore you should keep the Sabbath. It's, you, you want to kind of repeat that before every commandment to remind yourself, to remind your congregants, you know, what kind of God is this that, that gives these commands? So the context that we live in, uh, I often quote Diana Butler Bass, who made the statement that we live in a post-theistic world. And so this is a, a recovering first who God is, um, and that God has done great things. And therefore, and I, I, I think that is one word that could be a way of repeating it through, through the sermon, therefore, that, that uh, we are invited to recover our own identity in God, and thereby we're enabled to recover a relationship with others. And that's one of the divisions that people talk about uh, the Ten Commandments. First, it's about God, and then it's about our relationship with God in, in how we respond to if God is the one who has done these things, then we will worship God, we will uh, uh, honor God, and therefore, thereby, we can then be in a better relationship, a right relationship with one another. Right. That kind of that vertical and horizontal dimension of the, mm -hmm. the two tables of the law, as we talk mm -hmm. about. That. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for bringing up the covenant. So in the narrative lectionary uh, this year, we this is the third major covenant we've had. So we had a text on Noah and it's helpful to remind people there uh, there's parties in covenants and there's promises. And at least for the first three, there's signs. So, right. Noah promise. I will not destroy the world by fire. Sign 
rainbow, second covenant, Abraham and Sarah, you will be my people so that you will be blessed to be a blessing to others. The sign is male circumcision. This is the third one with Israel. Again, you will be my priestly people. Again, blessed to be a blessing. Um, the sign, though, is the Sabbath. Um, the people don't, most people don't know that about uh, the, the Mount Sinai covenant. And it's the need then to rest. It's the need then to be part of God's renewing rest for creation that God, uh, God's self does in Genesis 1. And that it is also then um, a time for worship, that the covenant, we continue to be renewed as we worship on a regular basis. So regular time for rest and regular time with God. That, that makes me think of, well, it, it brings to mind two uh, things. Uh, one is um, the Matthew text that's paralleled with, with uh, this week's reading, uh, where it says that Jesus came um, uh, to uh, fulfill um, uh, the, 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 the law not to, not to abolish it. Uh, had I been a part of the overview, I always add another covenant. And um, that is um, the covenant that God makes with Adam and Eve that says that um, that the uh, because of the fall, because of their response to uh, the temptation, that God is going to set the world right again. And the seed of Eve will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And so that becomes, if, if you read it that way, that becomes the first promise God makes post-fall. And that promise is fulfilled in the promised one, Jesus, who comes. And, and I just find that just a, a wonderful way to begin the story with creation and leading the story to the promise of new creation. The other thing, if you'll just bear with me another moment, one of my students, uh, one of my students in preaching, uh, Daniel Stevenson, he shared with the class uh, a way that the Ten Commandments had been introduced to him in undergraduate, and it moved, it changed the way that I read the, the commandments. It's a uh, permission as opposed to be a prohibition. And and just real quickly, what he does, I've already mentioned it. First of all, in a in, in that context, it would be a, a, a multiplicity of gods. It's permission to name the creator God. And then this sign, um, the Sabbath, is the greatest permission that you can give to an enslaved people. Permission to rest. Mm -hmm. Permission to rest. And then, given that their enslavement was was based on their ancestry, which is significant when the promise is also given to the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, it's permission to celebrate your ancestry, honor your father and mother. And then that shift, a permission to value life versus to take life, permission to expect fidelity in your personal life, as well as in your spiritual life, such that marriage becomes this a covenant that humans make with one another as God has made a covenant with humanity. And so that God has been faithful, part of the testimony we give witness to, we can expect that kind of belonging in our family relationships, in our personal relationship. And, and then I don't need, uh, excuse me, then I can... I have permission to trust God will continue to provide, which God has always been doing. And therefore, I don't need to take from others. I don't even need to desire uh, what I do not have that it appears that others might have. And that begins to sound a little like Jesus saying, to lust is as bad as to act on adultery. The desire becomes the deed. And right here in this Ten Commandments, we're told we don't need to desire what I don't have because I can trust that God is going to supply all that I need. Thanks for letting me take that. 
No, I think that's a beautiful way of, of interpreting them, Joy. Thanks for sharing that. I think I'll just add one thought to that because that was beautiful, which is the basic commandment God has for us in relation to our neighbors is to love. You shall love your neighbors yourself. And then the Ten Commandments can also be a picture of what love looks like. What does it look like when you love your neighbor? Well, you don't kill them and you don't um, you don't have an affair with their spouse. Uh, you don't take their stuff. In fact, and then every positive commandment also has negative obligations and the negative commandments that you shall not, they have positive obligations. You should help your neighbor to live a healthy life, help them take care of their stuff and so on. I love it. Yeah. And then all of that leads to life uh, with God and life in community. Uh, so the law is given not as a not as a death dealer, but as a gift for uh, to, to learn how to live as God's people, to learn how to love God and love your neighbor, to be a holy people and a priestly nation. 